well, if we're going to realize the sustainable development goals that were passed by the United Nations in 2015, that requires political organization. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nisreen, and you are listening to Insights from Abroad. We are part of the Middle East and South Asia Initiative in the College of Sciences at UCF. Our mission here is to educate, engage, and influence the international community. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Peter Hackes to discuss some topics surrounding our sustainability series. Dr. Hackes, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Dr. Hackes um, is one of our esteemed political science professors here at UCF since 2016. Dr. Hackes obtained two bachelor degrees from Montana State University in philosophy and film and theater art a master's in public administration with a focus in environmental policy from Northern Arizona University, and a PhD in political science from Northern Arizona University as well. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing your time with us. Mm -hmm. We are excited to... Uh, I've actually been here since 2003. 2003? I apologize. You younger than I <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Hackes, first question. It's more of a personal curiosity, actually, question. Um, what made you go from film, art, and philosophy to uh, political science and sustainability? Well, I've always been really interested in philosophical questions. In high school, I thought I would use film to influence society. But it turns out I'm really not good at it. So <laughs> I don't have the patience for editing and that kind of thing. So I uh, went more towards the philosophical side, which, you know, political science really is an ancient tradition, goes back to, for example, ancient Greece, where we're dealing with uh, you know, a lot of important philosophical questions that we still ask today. So for example, what is it that makes a good life? And how do you get there? Right. And so the political science side means that we can join those philosophical questions to political programs and to think about the nature of uh, social forces and those kinds of things. So I'm just really interested in those things. But yeah, film, I just wasn't very good at it. So. <laughs> and you got your bachelor's with honors. Well, you know, you try your best. Yes, so wonderful. <laughs> um, and I would like to um, mention a sentence that I heard you say a couple of weeks ago. When you plant a tree, you improve the water. Mm. Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? I thought that sentence was very interesting. Well, so so trees, I mean, really talking about forests, actually. So, you know, when you're... When you're um, taking care of forests, the trees, they serve a lot of different purposes. So there's, you know, uh, the, the way that they hold and release water. And the root system kind of maintains uh, stability of the soil. And all of that has to do with the interactions of the entire kind of watershed. And so when you're, when you're planting trees, especially on hillsides, you're really protecting the watershed itself and the way that water moves through the system. Okay. How does that affect the water crisis that we have in the world today? Does that mean that just a little bit more work, each one of us could do one more tree, each one of us could do, could prevent us from having a serious crisis in the future? Well, it really depends on the, the space that you're in, right? So ecosystems are very specific. And in the places where we were in Morocco, um, you know, water, the future of water does not look very good for, for most of Morocco. But when you you know, when you take care of forests, as many of the projects we saw were doing, they're kind of harnessing the water system. They're, they're kind of preserving the way that water moves through that system. If those trees weren't there, then you'd have things like, you know, uh, mudslides and you know, maybe. It kind of depends on the space, right? But Fires, like um, what happened in California? Well, so that, that has to do with how you manage the forest, okay. right? So the forest fires, they're working off of the fuel that's in the system, and if you've managed the forest well, then you've kind of kept the smaller scrub from kind of growing. And if you manage the forest poorly, then you allow for fuel to build up, and as things get drier, then you're going to have more you know, changes to the fire regime. It really has to do with the specific forest, you know, the specific area and ecosystem that you're that you're faced with. So, um, you know, you have to kind of take these questions uh, case by case, but. In Morocco, they were, you know, they were really um, doing, like for example, in this one tree nursery area we saw, they were, they were really protecting that whole watershed by planting those trees. So that takes me to my next question, and we'll give people a little bit of a preview about the project you're working on with the High Atlas Foundation. 
um, which was the last project that, that you did, that you traveled for to Morocco. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about the High Atlas Foundation so we can introduce it to the students? Oh, sure. Okay, so they're an NGO that is uh, run by uh, Dr. Yosef Benmeyer. And the main thing that his NGO does is help people form collectives. Uh, he works with grassroots civil society. Um, civil society is the space where people come together in the public. Uh, so not as individuals, but uh, as collectives. And here he helps them understand what they want for themselves. Uh, that's a really big part of what he does, is help empower these groups of, of folks who otherwise would be disorganized. So um, I looked on their website and I saw that so far they have planted a million trees. I'm not surprised. I mean, they, they, were, they are working at scale. They are, you know, they're, um, they've been sanctioned by the government to be... Um, I think he said that they were in charge of monitoring, measuring carbon for Morocco. It, 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 that might be slightly off, but he's he's been sanctioned by the government to really handle a lot of climate change issues. And one of the things that, that he does is he, um, the trees are capturing carbon. And if there's, eno if there's uh, enough saved, then you can actually sell the offsets to carbon markets, especially in Europe. And so that's one thing that he's doing. Okay, that sounds great. So they're pretty much trying to help the little guy. Oh yeah, that's that's their main thing, right? So they're doing a lot of sustainable development. You know, they do a lot of women's empowerment. They do a lot of different kinds of things. But but the central, you know, organizing feature of this NGO is just to empower collectives. Are, are these one of a kind projects? Is this the first time that something like that is being done? Oh, I, I doubt it. I, I don't know of any you know, other specific cases, but um, one of the things that, that is really good about this, though, is that these are very, very impoverished people who are in t you know, extremely disempowered. They live in a, a patronage system. So what that means is that the government really operates off of um, patronage. So that means that there's a patron, and if you're in the circle of benefits, then life is good, and if you're outside the circle, life is bad. And uh, the, the people that we spoke to are definitely outside the patronage system, so they are very disempowered. They're on their own. This is the only help they're receiving, being in a, co in a collective. Exactly. So that's the really great thing that the High Atlas Foundation is doing, is that he's helping, you know, they as a group are helping people um, organize themselves to have a little bit more power, uh, a, little bit more, a little bit more say. So in the uh, specific organizations, they are uh, formal groups that elect a president, for example, and then that person, the leader of that group, has an official right to be able to go to the regional government and tell them you know, what they want. Without that, they don't have that uh, capacity. And this is a clear case where we see the relationship between politics and sustainability. Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people in the world who really need uh, you know, they need a lot more say. Uh, they've been marginalized outside of different political systems, and in this case, uh, we were you know, speaking to a very, very poor uh, indigenous Amazir people in the mountains of the High Atlas. Uh, they were, in my opinion, they were entirely abandoned by their government. And so um, the social forces around uh, any particular group, that really has a lot to do with what kind of resources you have, the future, you know, for example, in, in, in many of these uh, villages, Education was a really, really big problem, um, and government services were, you know, largely absent. For example, if we're going to realize the sustainable development goals that were passed by the United Nations in 2015, unanimously, by the way, uh, and they're, they're just a, a proclamation of what you know what the world wants to do. 17 uh, sustainable development goals that requires political organization. And it requires that people, you know, um, people like the Amazir really matter, that they're, that they're counted and that their voice is heard. In a lot of cases, uh, people are marginalized outside this, you know, various political systems and are not heard. And so right now, their life is not sustainable. They're, they're not being sustained. They're, they're eking out an existence on the edge of survival. How are these projects changing their lives, the, the High Atlas Foundation project? Well, so like I said before, one of the most important things, I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on, but one of the more important things is that, that they have this collective voice now. And that, that's, so that's one thing. But other thing too is, is that um, 
it's helping them in a uh, specifically um, economic way. So there's economic benefits. We spoke to a women's collective. In Morocco, these groups, by the way, are entirely segregated by, by gender. So um, you don't have a mix of women's and men's groups. You have women's groups and you have men's groups. In the women's group that we were speaking with, they actually organized themselves into uh, a processing facility and they earn uh, um, profits from that and that goes, and they own, each of the women that are part of that, that organization own that facility. Oh, that's great. They get that, and so they get that financial reward. And one woman we spoke to, she, she actually got offered a, a job that paid more and she said, no, I'm gonna stick with my sisters and I'm going to uh, continue to realize these benefits of ownership. So that makes a big difference to people. When you have a little bit of control over your means of income, uh, as opposed to, you know, if you're working for somebody, you really don't. The employer has that kind of power. And so here you're, you know, you're, you're relying on yourself and, you, and your collective. And, the, you know, the, the people there, they unequivocally loved each other. And that was just so, I mean, it was so evident in every single conversation we had that they would say, you know, we are like one family. We are a family. We are here for each other every single time. We'd ask them, you know, what, what do you like about this organization? What don't you like? What, you know, and every single time they would say, we are, you know, um, we're here together. And, you know, if you think about that, that means that they're living on the edge of survival, like I said, but they're not doing it alone. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter. Um, how can we help as a community here at UCF, uh, students? Is there anything, even a gesture, something small that each one of us could do to help advance this project and help with sustainability? So my answer to these kinds of questions is always don't um, think of yourself just as an individual, but um, when you join collectives like the, like the villages that we spoke to, uh, that in, that in increases, you know, your personal influence. Uh, so this means coming together in in public. This is what we can do, right? Um, if we see ourselves as trying to, as a friend of mine wrote, uh, plant a tree, ride a bike, and save the world, it's not going to work. What what works is when we come together. And and so, for example, if you were to uh, help the High Atlas Foundation, that's coming together. It's building civil society. That's where, that's where individuals really can make a difference, that and also being leaders. So uh, if we, you know, think of ourselves as trying to just do something on it as an individual, you know, and send loving kindness out from our living room, that's great, but it's not going to do anything politically. So I heard that the High Atlas Foundation, they have a couple of internship positions available throughout the year and open to international students. Yes, they're very open to, to having students. Um, they, they really want to engage with people as much as they possibly can, and they, you know, Dr. Ben Myers, he encourages people to approach him to work with him, and, and there, he has people from all over the world working with him at any one time. Okay, and let's just add that High Atlas Foundation does projects in Morocco, um, but their headquarters is in New York. They have an office in New York. It is a nonprofit, and it is mm -hmm. easy to reach them in the United States just by um, call in the number for the office in New York or reach them via email via the website. Uh, we have all of this information in our website and we'll give you all of the information towards the end of this interview. Dr. Peter, um, you also have other projects you have been working on. We would love to hear about that. Oh gosh, well, I mean, um, I always got you know a million things in the pipeline. <laughs> um, one thing that, that uh, I, I work on a lot is ocean politics. And so we've been doing a lot of different things with trying to understand how the oceans are governed. I have a number of uh, projects working on that. We use a language-based analysis for that particular thing. Another project we have is, um, is understanding the organization of climate denial or the rejection of climate science. I've been working on that since the beginning of my career. And um, right now we're finishing up a project of deep reading of 108 English language books that reject the orthodox position on climate science. That's wow. taken about yeah, oh man, maybe nine years to do because you have to do it systematically and scientifically. So what that means is that we are coding and trying to systematically understand what's being argued in these books, what are the rationale for rejecting climate science. And 
that was all the English language books we could find that do that. And so we feel like we have a body of literature that, you know, if we can understand this thing, then maybe we'll get somewhere. And the bottom line is that, you know, people reject climate science, we believe, because they're afraid. How far back do these books date? Uh, first one is published in 1982. So that's not even that ancient. It's, it's no, 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 no. I mean, you know, you think about um, the consensus on climate change really starts in the 1970s with the, uh, I think, the Charney Report. It was a, a U.S. government uh, study of climate. And it, it builds from there and really kind of comes onto the global scene in 1992 with the Rio Earth Summit. Um, and that's, that's where you know, we really start to, to discuss climate change as an international community. And then, uh, of course, we have the you know, Intergovernmental Panel uh, for Climate Change reports that come out every few years. The last one was the fifth assessment report. And each, each series of studies that come out really solidify, reify, they, the, the science is getting stronger and stronger is what I'm trying to say. And, and the consensus itself is, is a extremely strong. We believe between 90 and 97 percent of, of people who do climate change research endorse and, and see the consensus position as actually being very solid. So uh, at this point, warming is unequivocal, and the drivers for that climate change are really well understood, the basics here we're talking about. The unfortunate part about all this is that we have a, about, f I want to say, uh, close to half of the American public believes that climate change science itself is divided, and this couldn't be more wrong. Um, but there's, you know, the reason why by U.S. citizens think that climate change is, you know, the community is divided is because of this organized campaign to, to spread misinformation. So we have, um, you know, in studying that organization, in studying that campaign, we believe that we'll, we're able to apply a little bit of leverage and, and insight for the American people and for the international community too. Knowledge is gold. Yeah, yeah. Um, but knowledge isn't the only answer, right? Because, well, the IPCC was writing, uh, you know, these reports for, for decades now. You know, the science gets stronger and stronger, and we do know this already, but, but there are people who want to undermine, really, our, our attempts to mitigate climate change. That's, that's what, part of what the fear is. And that's very unfortunate, because we're playing with our kids' future. Well, if you think about it, it's a, it's a pretty serious question, right? Um, most people in, this, you know, in, the, in the research community that work on climate change believe strongly that the world economy needs to decarbonize, and it needs to do so quickly. That's a big threat to people who see, you know, kind of this, the, the sense of Western progress locked in from fossil fuels. And, it, you know, if you think about what is an industrialized country, it's a country that was built on fossil fuels by definition. Um, and so that, that, um, that, that makes people scared, right? So it's, it's a big question. But we also have, you know, a number of ways of thinking about this and, and answering these questions. So there's, you know, for example, you could break... You could break the economy into different chunks, like uh, you know the the energy industry, the housing, transportation, and then see where we can where we can cut. And there's also um, enormous opportunities here for a different element uh, of the economy to grow. Uh, but you know, fossil fuel industries have enormous amounts of power, and they have uh, tried to freeze out you know kind of renewables in, in different ways. So there's a bit of, of um, uh, crony capitalism that goes on where the established industries try to protect their own market shares by keeping other industries out and uh, other market players. And I think that's, that, that has been happening to some degree. Last but not least, Dr. Hackes, um, I would like to know a little bit more about the lab you're running. Great opportunity for the students on campus um, to join if, if that's something they're interested in and learn a little bit more and be able to work with you closely. Something definitely that was trying to be part of the semester, but unfortunately it didn't uh, work out at the end. So um, I would like to offer that opportunity to the students that are listening to us. Sure, um, they have to interview for it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, been running this undergraduate research lab, we call it the Political Ecology Lab in Political Science. Um, and it's, it's meant to introduce students to research ethics, methods, you know, professional development, 
And um, I created the lab. I don't like get teaching credit for this, but I created the lab because I wanted to make my educational efforts more personal. You know, UCF is a very large place, and so I don't always get to know the students. But the students who are really enthusiastic about environmental issues and they come to get to know me, you know, um, sometimes I'll offer them an opportunity to join the lab, and um, you know, we'll have lab dinners at my house, and you know, they get to know my wife, and it, it's community building. And a lot of these students, you know, they they um, I don't actually select students based off of like a perfect GPA. I actually select students who are really interested. And so you get to see the students grow. And, you know, I've had, you know, honestly, some fairly mediocre scholars become really fantastic. And that's, I love seeing that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's, having it's really the rewarding. opportunity and giving the opportunity to students is wonderful. Um, well, Dr. Hackus, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. And we thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences with us. If you want to learn more about today's guest, our mission, or our program, you can visit us at sciences.ucf.edu forward slash PMBF program. Sciences.ucf.edu forward slash PMBF program. For the Middle East and South Asia Studies program here at UCF, this is Nisreen. Thank you for listening. If we're going to 